Second Peter chapter 1, and I want to read from there. As we continue this discussion of using God's word to build your faith walk. And hopefully I can wrap that up today. So let me just start reading with verse 5. Because of this, make every effort to add integrity to your faith, and to integrity add knowledge, to knowledge add self-control, to self-control add endurance, to endurance add godliness, to godliness add Christian affection, to Christian affection add love. If you have these qualities and they are increasing, it demonstrates that your knowledge about our Lord Jesus Christ is living and productive. If these qualities aren't present in your life, you're short-sighted and have forgotten that you were cleansed from your past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, use more effort <coughs> to make God's calling and choosing of you secure. If you keep doing this, you will never fall away. Then you will also be given the wealth of entering into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will always remind you about these qualities, although you already know about them and are well grounded in the truth that you now have. As long as I'm still alive, I think it's right to refresh your memory. I know that I will die soon. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made that clear to me, so I will make every effort to see that you remember these things. I was just thinking as I read that, you got to love Peter's logic there. You know, he says, I know I'm going. I just think I got to nag you until I'm gone. And, uh, you wonder sometimes, you know, and I have to tell you, there are times as a pastor, I feel a little like a nag. And, and you can say, oh, no, you're not. But see, notice nobody did. All right? Because I am. And, and the sad reality is it's not because of me that I have to nag people about following the word. It's because of people. And, and, and that's one of the realities. We can forget if we're careless. That's why it's so important to make a habit out of reading the Word daily. Because you can forget the important principles of God if you don't. It's the nature of the struggle. And so God's divine power we know has given us everything. And we've talked about this. So now we want to talk about using God's Word to add or to our faith. And a lot of times people don't think in those terms. They think faith is something you muster up, but faith is something you develop through God's word. And we use his word to add to our faith and, and essentially our faith walk so that it's more than just I believe and it becomes I am. It's not, I believe in Christ, but I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. Those are different things. And, and it's not even, well, I think there's a God out there. But no, I am his child. I am his servant. That happens through a process with God's word, not just in mental epiphany. And, and so we, we think of that. And I want to talk about, you know, I talked about the first thing we add to our faith is integrity and 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 of that's important and then we add knowledge to our integrity and so the idea of adding integrity to your faith is that you don't give yourself slack that you are going to be who you're supposed to be and a lot of people don't have the integrity in their faith that have you ever noticed how easy it is to notice someone else's failure to follow Christ and overlook yours have you ever noticed how many speeches sound like they should be preached to you instead of the person you're preaching to? And, and it's because at some point the idea of integrity being added to our faith is that we use God's word to look at us instead of others. And, and so this is quickened to my mind <clears throat> for whatever reason. There's an old hymn called In the Sweet By and By. 
And, and the writing of that hymn is interesting. It only took about 15 minutes in total to write the hymns in the suite by and by. And the, the author of the music tells the story, or the author of the words tells the story. And he was in a partnership of songwriting with another man who was quite the musician. And, and yet, like some musicians, had this, this bent towards melancholy that there were times he just... Saw, would find himself in a certain amount of angst over life and, and everything wasn't ideally perfect and he would, he would have those moments of just melancholy in his life. And, and he was that kind of a guy and he showed up in their shop one day and, and he was warming himself by the stove and the other man who wrote the lyrics was sitting at the desk and, and he said, how are you doing today? And he just sighed and went, it'll be fine by and by. Right? You ever feel that way? And, and, and the man who wrote the lyrics said, I knew him as soon as he started having to make music for something, he would cheer up. And he said, I started writing these lyrics in the sweet by and by. And he wrote out the song. He says, it took me all of five minutes to write the lyrics to the song. And I handed it to him. And he wrote the rest of the music in 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, they were singing the hymn in the sweet by and by. And the thing that strikes me about that is how many times when people can hear that story can think, how, how can a good Christian feel so down? Really? You don't ever? It's called humanity. And somewhere we've created this, this thing of, well... You know, the good Christian, as I talked about, is the perfect humanista, the little Christianista who, who just never makes any mistakes. But the good Christian is one who builds on their faith and honesty about who and where they are with Jesus. Add to your faith integrity. Stop looking at yourself through rose-colored glasses and see the reality of what Jesus has changed and what he needs to change. That's adding integrity to our faith. And, and, and so as we do that, then we add knowledge. And, and the idea is simply we have to be workmen who are rightly dividing the word of truth because we have labored and studied over Scripture. We have to develop the kind of scriptural knowledge that allows us to have an integral walk with the Lord. If it's in the Bible, you can't avoid it. And that's knowledge. And, and so we see that. And then, of course, self-control and, and the leading the disciplined life. And I talked about that. And so we come to this thing now where we add something to self-control. And if self-control is the disciplined Christian life, which, which is important, a disciplined life is a good thing, what is endurance? The ability to have self-control for a long time. Now, if we think of, of running races, like foot races, how many know it takes a discipline to withhold your speed in a long-distance race? You know, everyone takes off running, and, and, and you're going along, and, and if you know the race is longer, you run slower. But there are always those people in the crowd that have to be first off the blocks. Even if it's a 10-mile run. Or, or in traffic, we know that. We were driving over here. I hope it wasn't any of you guys. And we were driving, and, and uh, everybody was in a hurry to pass. And so they're flying by us on the new road. And, and uh, that was fine. And I noticed when we got here... They were right in front of me. Right? So, and well, one of them I passed because there was this guy with blue and red lights that had pulled him over, but that's a different story. Right? And I hate to relish in the moment, but, well, I better not. So, but, but we think the life is a sprint, and the problem with Christians is they want to exercise self control for a short amount of time. And you hear people say this, so if we pick on whatever it is, whether it's exercise or eating right or all the different things that people grapple with, and, and the, the phrase now is, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle change. 
I've heard that. Well, I've heard that from the last six diets. Which, if it were, then there would be a change. When I was a mover, I I used to. Um, I, people would say, you're pretty fit. What exercise equipment do you think works best? It says, whatever they are, I have to carry them onto the truck. <laughs> and I found that everybody's exercise, I got more exercise from everybody's exercise equipment than they did. <laughs> what works? The one you do daily, endurance. Self-discipline over time is Endurance. And the Bible says the race isn't to the swift. And so when we are adding to this idea of I'm going to lead a disciplined life, you're not going to lead a disciplined life for a week and then think God's going to pour out the blessings from the windows of heaven. This is a, this is a marathon of discipline, this thing we call Christian living. It's a marathon of discipline. We think, well, if I discipline myself for a month or two, all my bad desires will go away. If you discipline yourself for a lifetime, they might. You know, if I fast for a week, I won't be tempted anymore in my life. <laughs> Many of you say that, you're tempted to eat. And so self-control is this, and with endurance is this idea of fortitude, the ability to maintain discipline for a lifetime. And what do we add to this endurance? Godliness. Which, which you say, what does godliness mean? Essentially, it comes from two words, God-likeness. And that's where in Romans uh, it tells us in, in verse 29. Actually, I love to combine 28 and 29 because they're combined in Scripture. But we like to, you hear people say, all things work together for good for them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Now, I got saved in the late 70s, and, and it was the tail end of kind of a, what, maybe the Jesus movement, but it was what I would call the tail end of the bumper sticker and slogan movement. Because everybody had a lot of cliche statements for you that would just suddenly make you a better Christian. You know, and they had tape series or learning Christian discipline while you sleep and stuff like that. They didn't really. But they might have. I don't know. Mark said he had one. But I don't know. And, uh, but, but there were, everywhere you looked, there were special little Jesus bumper stickers. And there were slogans. And there was this. And there was that. And, well, you, and, and you know, they'd say things like, you just got to believe, brother. Which, that was the last thing to say to an intellectual cynic. But they would, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and there'd always be those people when you're having a try. Well, all things work together for good. And, and that's how it sounded to me. And you know what I'm talking about. Because you were either one of those people or you knew one. Or both. And the reality is you have to at some, and I, I agree, all things work together for good. But see, good is not a gingerbread house covered with candy because we know that's where the witch lives. Hansel and Gretel. It's not scripture, but in case you're wondering, it's not. Uh, don't know what you're reading. But, uh, but, but good, we have to, we answer the question, what is the good See, in Romans 8, 29, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And you say, what is the good? It's answered in verse 29. Right, the sentence right afterwards. For whom he foreknew, he predetermined that they would be conformed to the image of his son, Christ Jesus. See, if you're going to walk with God... He has a plan, a predetermined plan for your life. And it's this. You will become like Jesus. And if you're not, you're not walking with him. See, it was, you know, it's the first half of that statement got a yay, and the second half got silence. But both are equally true. 
The good isn't that all everything will be wonderful and easy or all that. No, it is that things happen in my life to conform me to the image of Jesus. Sometimes it's hardship, sometimes it's sorrow, sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's embarrassment. But those things work to mold me into the image of the Lord God. See, I add to my endurance this thing we call a life change, this thing which is a lifelong walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I add to that the knowledge that everything is working to conform me to the image of his son, which is he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the day of the Lord Jesus, which we get from Philippians. That's what's going on. And so, you know, if I continue with the whole Hansel and Gretel thing, the good is not a gingerbread house, it's a cross. You know, there, some would have said there was a cross, there was a shadow of a cross over the, the manger of the Lord, which would be like the cradle of the Lord. There was a, there was a shadow of a cross. But I'm going to tell you something, there's a shadow of a cross over your manger too. There's a shadow of a cross over your, your baby blanket. Not a gingerbread house. And see, too many Christians want a gingerbread house where they can be gluttonous, indulgent children. But see, that's the kind of thing the devil always tempts you with. Now, if you go out of here and say, our pastor preached from Grimm's fairy tales, you just don't do that. <laughs> just don't do that. And what do we add to Godliness. Well, let me talk a little bit about godliness a little more. What do we add to our endurance? In my walk with the Lord over time, I want to add all his holiness, all his purity, all his compassion, and all of his kindness. See, there are people that try to have the Lord's kindness without the Lord's purity. But you can't have God's kindness without God's purity. Because his purity is what makes his kindness so exceptional. Because he would never sin, it's exceptional that he's tolerant with those of us who do. See, it's easy to overlook sins that are like your own. But the greater you grow in holiness, the greater you grow in true purity with the Lord, the more demand there will be on your mercy muscle. It's not a gift. It's a, it's a muscle. It gets stronger with exercise. The, the more clean you become, the more love it demands to embrace those who aren't clean. Now, you know, it's like when, when our children were little, mess just kind of oozes out of the pores of children. You know, when they're babies, they slobber and, and other things, and right? And, and you have that, and, and when they're toddlers, they've always got something on their hands. And, and it's so prolific, even Debbie can't keep up with it. And, and you know, when, when I was a dad and, and my children were smaller, I'm still a dad, but my children aren't smaller. They're smaller than me, that's about it. And uh, when they were smaller, you know, Debbie say, here, hold the baby. And if you always had, how many know, what do you always have when you hold a baby? And if you don't, you got this big thing that looks like a seagull attack to you when you preach. This big white, So, in fact, I remember one time, uh, I don't, there's so many things, you know, I don't like to be touched a whole lot to start with, and especially by surprise, but I really don't like to be touched by gooey hands, you know, and all that sort of stuff, and 
And so, so there's always that. And so it cre- there's this demand, you know. So you get all dressed up for church and, and you're clean and you're shiny and, and all that and, and you're ready to go. And, and your child runs up to you and grabs your pants. See, it wouldn't matter if I was dirty. I hope you follow. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter if I just come in from working in the yard and I had a bunch of, you know, yard debris all over my pants and I was getting ready to throw them in the laundry anyhow. It wouldn't take any grace for me to accept my child's embrace. But it does when you're clean. I keep thinking of a funny story I'm going to tell because it's a funny story. Why not tell it? When, when crew was little, right, we're, it's a church barbecue, and I'm dressed fine and clean and all that, and we're outside, and, and crew comes up to me. He used to call me Debbie. <laughs> That's true. And uh, he wants me to pick him up, right? So I pick him up. And he reaches out, and he's eating something. You couldn't really tell anymore what it was. And he grabs my goatee. And it was a little longer. And he grabs it and starts playing with it. And Jade's watching this, and she's just, I don't know how much she enjoyed it. I think she did, very much. But Angie says to me, she's standing there and goes, you know, if one of us did that, he'd kill us. It's a good thing he likes children. And I think that's what it means when we climb up in God's lap. I think his, his kindness is magnified by his purity. And if you add kindness before you add purity, you don't understand it. And so we add to our godliness Christian affection. And it's an interesting order of things because nowadays so many Christians want to add to their faith Christian affection. As soon as they get saved, brotherly love. That's everything. But it doesn't mean anything. It's cheapened by the lack of Christian character. In fact, nowadays people say, I love you pretty easily. I'm not very good at it. Never was. So people that barely know me will say, love you, brother. It's like, give me a chance, you won't. (laughs) It doesn't have meaning. The absence of Christian character. It has no meaning. Love love is meaningless without Christ-likeness. You might as well love a hamburger. And you'll only love it as long as it's good. See, Christians today skip right past integrity. They skip right past knowledge. They skip right past self-control. They skip right past godliness. And they want to go right to Christian affection. And if you do, you don't have Christian affection. You have a much more shallow, self-interested version of affection. I like you because you make me feel good. Oh, Pastor Charles, I love you. Why? Oh, you just, when you preach, it just touches me. Give me a couple weeks. I'm going to stomp all over your toes in a little bit, and you're going to hate me. What? Right now, you're going, oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. But in a few weeks, you're going to come and say, what I see here is, and I think you were just quite a little, weren't sure, maybe you're going to start trying to correct me, which you should make an appointment for that so I can enjoy the experience. (laughs) And, And we go through this. But what do you add to affection? Love. See, if affection, brotherly kindness, it's the words phileo. It's, I like you because something happens in me when I'm around you. It's the word used to describe the kiss of Judas. 
in Luke, when it comes and Judas approaches him, it says, Judas Philet, Jesus, it, Philet, oh, it, it, he showed him affection. Showed him something that looked like love but wasn't. It's the question Jesus asked of Peter that made Peter mad. In the book of John at the last chapter there in the, the breakfast by the sea. And the Lord says to Peter, do you love me? And in Greek, of course, he says agapes me, which is do you love me? And Peter answers his first question. Phileo se, I like you. Try that on your dearly beloved. Tia looks at Mike dearly and says, Mikey, do you love me? He goes, I like you. I can tell by Mikey's laugh that would get him in trouble. <laughs> Regardless of how he feels, he's going he's gonna to tell her he loves her because he's afraid of her. We know that. We all know that. We watched him grow up in this church. We know that. But Peter tells the Lord, I just like you. I have affection for you. Which is sad because it's the same word that described the kiss of Judas. He came and showed him affection. And it's Jesus that said, you betray me with a kiss. Second time Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Agapes me. Right? Peter says, I like you. Phileo se, I like you. I have affection for you. The third time Jesus asked Peter, Phileo me, do you have affection for me? And that's when Peter gets frustrated and says, you know all things. You know I have affection for you. Peter could not commit to love at that point. Which is why he had to be sifted. It's why he had to be challenged. Later on in his life, he certainly committed to love. There's no question about that. So what do we, we, we come to the Lord and we start growing in the Lord and, and things happen and it's good. We're becoming new creatures. There's changes being made. And we start to appreciate the people around us. They're not our kind of people or they wouldn't have been, but we start to appreciate them because they're faithful and they're there and they, they help us f get through this process and, and we're feeling attached that's affection, but what do we have to add to that? We have to add love. That thing that changes us in a way that they matter even when we don't want them to. That people matter because they're people. That we show love because God loves everyone else. It's not just... Well, I feel good about those people who make me feel good, but I love you because of the kindness of God. And we don't jump from belief to love. There's growth in the process. By the way, that's mercy. But if we try to manufacture love without, all, without the holiness, without the steadfastness, without the discipline, it's not going to be faithful love. And that's why people will turn their back on Jesus. And it's why they'll turn their back on other people. Because they don't have faithful love. Love comes out of being the kind of well-built Christian that God's word guides you to be. Are you striving to become the kind of well-built Christian that God's word will guide you to be? See, a lot of times we only invest our energy in things we get something out of instead of investing our energy because it's called faithfulness. Without that foundation, you don't have true love. 
So as I'm standing here, I'm just going to use some illustrations that the Lord is laying on my heart about love that flows out of faithfulness. So we, um, Friday, wasn't it Friday? We were at a funeral. And it was a funeral of someone that mattered to me, of course. But, but it's not just that. We had to drive 100 miles to get to that funeral. And it was one of my professors, Brother Crimes, he preached here. I gave him a B. Some of you wanted him to get an A, but he got a B. Because that's what he gave me in pulpit speech. He wasn't getting a better grade. He, which, by the way, he thought was funny. Um, because w- we went to his wife's service a while back, uh, not that a year or so ago, and... Um, he remembered it, and he was telling one of the professors, do you know what this guy did to me? So, um, but I felt it was just. Any, what was that about? Anyhow, we went because he mattered. But we went because the people who loved him matter. And I was friends with his son. And it mattered to his son when I was there. And, you know, if I can just be very open and personal about things. We have funerals here, and people don't show up to support one another. Maybe we just haven't grown in our love. Maybe we're not so mature as we think. We have funerals and we think of some family members of someone in the church and we think, well, I didn't know their family members so I don't need to be there. Maybe we just don't know how to love like we should. We have baby showers and bridal showers of people that maybe you don't know and so you don't show up even though they're part of this church. Maybe, maybe all you have is affection and you haven't added love yet. We have weddings that people don't attend because they have other things they'd rather do. Maybe you just haven't had added love to your... Or maybe you added it before you had holiness. I don't know. But there's a lack of faithfulness to the brethren. That bothers me. Personally. It's your business. I'm not trying to control anyone. It just bothers me it bothers me enough that that's not how I'm going to be and so in in the same note we've been doing family Sundays for 25 years 25 years we have taken the fifth Sunday of the month and set it aside to embrace our children some of you were children when we started doing it. And in 25 years, I regularly hear people say, well, I don't get much out of Family Sunday. And I politely put up with that kind of foolishness. Did I call it foolishness out loud? I politely put up with it. So every service we have should be about you. Every church service should be all as, the, the whole success of our church services should be based on whether you get something or not. Maybe we just haven't had added love to our affection. I don't like to read reviews about the church, so, but I did one time. I haven't since. And because what I've learned about most reviews, I'm just not interested. If people were right more often, I might be. But um, I, I, one time I saw a Google review on our church specifically, and I got curious. So I looked at it. And it was a guy said, too many noisy kids. Hated that place. 
thought, man, praise God he put that out there so everyone who agrees with him could just stay away. Every grumpy old curmudgeon that doesn't want to get past themselves and love children could just go somewhere else. See, you know, we'll say, oh, Charles likes kids. I love kids. But there aren't many things about children that I enjoy. It's true. They're dirty and they're noisy and other things. And and they can't discuss philosophy or psychology. Some of them don't even know how to ride a bike. I mean, there's just nothing I have in common with them. What's that got to do with love? Let's pray. Because we need it now. (laughs) Lord, teach us to add to our affection love. Teach us to add to our faith. Teach us to add integrity. And and teach us to add self-control. And teach us to add endurance. And teach us to add godliness. And teach us to add to that godliness kindness, a sense of affection and a value for one another. And then, Lord, teach us to love and to love faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.